Okay. Okay, so, so last time we wanted, so we, we were able to start from the <coughs> from the beginning, I mean after having very general consideration on GFD phenomena, we understood we uh, moved from the inertial frame of reference to rotational frame of reference. We understood that we need uh, another term in our equations <coughs> to explain this, uh, this change, which is the uh, apparent force known as Coriolis force. We understood what is the effect and so on. Then uh, we started to review all the equations which uh, rule the dynamics in the GFD. And we ended with the two sets of equations, one of seawater, where we have, in particular, the presence of salinity. And we have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven equations. And then we also have uh, still seven equations for the air, where we have here the equation of state for dry air. And then we also have the um, humidity, Q, and then we also use the, the potential um, the potential temperature. Then we understood that it is quite difficult to solve this equation. So we started to say, OK, how we can uh, simplify this equation in order to find some solution, some meaningful, meaningful solution for GFT phenomena. And the first uh, approximation was the Businex approximation, which says that the density can be written like a background density, rho zero plus a rho prime, because in nature, we can say that density variation, both in, in atmosphere and ocean, are very small with respect to the background density. <coughs> but we are not satisfied, because we want also to uh, say something more, because still, even if we, um, we use the approximation, the Businex approximation, we still need something, because still, with the boosting approximation, the equation remains quite difficult. So if we take a, <coughs> uh, as a reference this table here, and we remember that we are interested to study um, flows which have uh, time scale which are larger than the rotational time scale, 24 hours, which also, <coughs> uh, the dynamic of the um, phenomena are larger than the um, than the temp of the rotational time scale, and also that phenomena which have uh, horizontal scales much larger than the vertical scale. These are like something which are uh, observable in nature because cyclones and also currents, but more in general, atmosphere and ocean um, have um, depth which is much, much smaller with respect to the horizontal one. So we expect that sooner or later we will have to um, uh, to think about uh, almost two-dimensional flows, okay? And that the three-dimensional, the three-dimension, the three-dimensionality will be important only when we have variation in density, because density is much more important in the vertical, okay? So the idea that we are starting to have is that the horizontal scales are much more uh, affected by rotation while the vertical scale are much more affected by stratification, OK? So if we uh, re uh, try to review the, uh, the equations, we can find further, um, uh, let's say, further information about the length scale of what? Of what we need. So we need something concerning the vertical velocity, which we, we expect that will be much smaller than the horizontal one, because this is what we are observing in nature. And also to have some simplification, some further simplification in 
uh, in, the, in the equation. So in order to move from the equation that we saw, equation set that we saw in the previous slide to something which is easier. So if we take the continuity equation, the xu plus the yv v plus the zw, which this, don't forget, is the result of the Boussinex approximation, okay? Because the Boussinex approximation told, told us that uh, <coughs> in, uh, in presence of uh, Boussinex fluid, so fluid which where the density variation are much smaller than the, de the background density, we can move from the continuity equation which uh, uh, are related with the uh, variation in time of density to a simpler uh, divergence-free equation, okay? And in particular, there was one question maybe from you last time that uh, I didn't proper, I, I, I thought about it. And uh, you said, why we, I mean, where is the, the, dependent, the time dependency of the, of the um, density? So the time dependency of the density still exists because uh, if you put, for example, from the sea surface, from the uh, seawater, if you put together, so consider the energy equation, which is this one. In the Boussinex approximation, we remove this one, right? Then we have only this term here, which is equal to a Laplacian, okay? So if we write this kt over rho cv as a k, let's say, okay? And then we move, uh, you remember we talked about the end diffusivity. So these two equations, the dt dt and the s dt are hol holomorphic, the same form. And if we put this equation here, you can do it by, by home, as a homework. Here, you will find something which is the rho dt, which is equal to k Laplacian of, um, uh, of rho, okay? So, Thanks to the Boussinex equation, we can uh, reduce these three equations to sing one single equation, okay? Where k is this eddy diffusivity. So let's come back here. So we have. Uh, <coughs> make the scale analysis. So the first term, how does it scale? So u scales as capital U, and then we have a derivative in x. And derivative in x scales as L, right? This is the same, u over L. And this, w over over H. H. Okay. So, uh, assume the same is for the atmosphere. This is the same. The continuity equation is the same in atmosphere and in the ocean. So we are saying the horizontal motion is significant, but we are ignoring the vertical. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. We are just starting from this. We will arrive to this, but uh, we. This is something that we can think about because okay. And also you can uh, experimentally measure it because if you if you look at the velocity of the wind, of course they are much larger in the uh, in the horizontal than in the vertical. Apart if you are in a very localized system like uh, um, hurricanes, where you can have very strong vertical velocity. So the idea is that uh, <coughs> this return must balance, okay? Because I have uh, I must have uh, a balance in order to have zero. Analysis. Yeah. Because this is du over dx. So if we talk about uh, um, unit of measure, this is a velocity and this is a length. Okay? So this is the velocity in the horizontal and this is the length in the horizontal. So the same for here, because x, y, u, and v have the same scale, while over the uh, vertical, we have w over h. So we can have three cases. The first case is that this term
term is much larger than the other ones. So if this term is much larger than this, it means that this here dominate over this one. So it means that my equation of continuity simply becomes this one. OK? So the equation is only based on the fact that the vertical variation of vertical velocity are 0. So what does it mean? If the vertical velocity doesn't change in vertical, what does it mean? That the vertical velocity is constant. constant. So can it be possible? So Why? Because there is no way you can keep the vertical velocity constant mm -hmm. to change as the body rotates. Mm -hmm. Let's let's uh, don't think about buoyancy. We are just considering the conservation of mass. So, if we should be in the universe without any kind of uh, solid boundary, why not? We can have it. But in our planet, we can have the sea, for example, and the troposphere, and the bottom of the sea or the land. Ah, you were here before. <laughs> okay, so these these are um, solid boundaries. So if I say that the the vertical velocity is constant here, it means that I have the same vertical velocity over the entire fluid, ocean, atmosphere, also atmosphere. So is it possible? Why is not possible? Pressure changes. Yes, that's okay with the pressure, but think something more basic. What's happening here? Gravity. Sorry? Gravity. Mm, not exactly gravity. So I have something here. So can I have here a velocity which is uh, 5, let's say, meter per second? Which I say that is 5 meter per second everywhere. Can I have it here? No. Because if I have here, in some sense, there should be a, a layer where I have something which is converging horizontally in order to have a vertical velocity. But if I'm saying that the horizontal convergence, so don't forget this, we have horizontal convergence or divergence and vertical convergence or divergence. So if this is 0, I cannot have this. So this is not possible. So we cannot have never. So vertical convergence or divergence in our, I mean, in uh, Earth-like planets or uh, environments where we have some uh, uh, solid boundary, never, never we can have this, this case. We can have the, old, the, the opposite. So that this term here is much smaller than these two. So this means that so that we can neglect this with respect to this to the uh, horizontal convergence. So is this possible? So we are having a complete balance on the horizontal. So if I, I I'm just considering the, every single horizontal layer, x, y. So I'm saying that the convergence or divergence along the x counteract or is balanced by the convergence or divergence over y. Is it possible? If I have convergence over the x direction, I can have divergence here. Okay? So 
this is something that we can uh, accept. <coughs> we can also accept uh, the third case where we have the horizontal, uh, sorry, the vertical divergence or convergence which counterbalance the horizontal one, which is similar to this one, but we have something also here. Okay? So I can have divergence, part of this come up and down, and part goes in this direction. Okay? So every single combination of the three terms can exist, can be possible. So this means that only these two cases are possible. And what we can conclude is that from the analysis, from the scale analysis of the continuity equation, we can take the W over H is at least smaller or order of U over N. And this what means? This means that W will be smaller of the order of H over L multiplied by U. Okay? But H over L is much smaller than 1. So this means that W, as expected, is much smaller than U. So we have obtained uh, another a very important limit to our definition, our description of GFD, that from the analysis, the scale analysis of the continuity um, equation, we obtain that the vertical velocity, the scale of the vertical velocity, will be almost much smaller than the horizontal one, in general. This is U, this is V. This is U, still okay. U. Because this is much smaller than 1. <coughs> Good. Now we can move to the first equation of motion. Sorry, the first uh, uh, momentum equation in the x direction. And then move to the analysis. We will do the same exercise to the other equation. So. So if I take the first one, so I will have, so let's uh, move, you remember we, we calculate this rho as rho zero plus rho prime, so we can put rho, rho zero here, and then we, we remember that this is related to the diffusion. So what we obtain, we have du over dt plus u du dx plus v du dy plus w du dz minus fv <coughs> plus f star w equal minus 1 over 0 dp dx and then from the equation, uh, from the uh, Boussinger approximation, we obtained the second derivative. <coughs> of the U component, okay? Okay, so, so U scales as the capital U. T scales like capital T, W scales like capital W, F scales like omega, and P scales like P, capital P. Okay, so what is U, the U over the, the T? Yes, is the acceleration. How does it scale? U over L. Over, no, why L? Oh, T. U over T. How does it scale the first term of advection? U squared. Over? Over L. This one? 
You square this one? This one? U W. U W. Okay. W. <laughs> Over? H. 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 Sorry, it's a Z, huh? Yeah. This? Omega. Mm -hmm. U. And this? Omega. This is the same, man. Eh? F star. Omega? U. W. W. <coughs> then we have capital P over rho zero is a constant and L. L. Then we have ni because it's a constant u over L, 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 L square u over L square u over T, T square Z, 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 Z. Great. Okay, very nice. Whoa. Okay, so let's see how if using this for one, two, three, and four uh, hypotheses, we can simplify something. <coughs> so the thing, the first thing that you can see, you want, you would like to remove. What is? Look at this. This, 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 and this. Sorry? Where we have divisible by h. You don't, uh, you, uh, you want to divide by? I mean, where we have the h mm -hmm. goes away. Why? Because we are under the assumption that l is far, far more. But uh, if, okay, you can do this. Okay, you can do this, but which, where? Because if you want to do this, you have to only uh, be closer to this expression. W component. The W component, uh, yeah. which one? So this one, you with, the, with, with, with respect to which one you would uh, uh, neglect? Respect to H. Omega U. To omega U. To omega U. Hmm. So I would say that if you want to say that this is much smaller than this one, it means that W over H is much smaller than omega, right? With omega W. Sorry? Negative with omega W. With um, omega W, so this and this, so you say W over H U much smaller than omega W. I can say that U is much, U is not much smaller than W. Look, very, these two, easier, much easier. Omega W can be the negative. Can be the negative, yes. Much easier. And look at this. Yeah. H, much smaller. H, square can be neglected. Which one of these three? The uh, last one. The last one. The last one you will neglect? So this is smaller than this one? Hey, no, no, no. You're Hard. 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 Okay. It's enough. Uh, yes. <laughs> you cannot do nothing more because you don't have any kind of uh, hypothesis that suggests any other simplification. So what we can say, which is just good for our purposes, is that one of the two terms is uh, negligible. So we have a very nice um, simplification of the Coriolis term. And uh, what we obtain here is that uh, the uh, diffusion or the friction, because this is the, the, the term which describes us, friction effect, in the horizontal is much smaller than one in the, in the, in the vertical. Okay? So the horizontal friction, in some sense, is much smaller than the vertical friction. Okay? In, in some consideration, and you will see this for if you work with, the, with models, usually in the models, people try to use different constant, numerical constant for me. And in particular, people write A, capital A H U over L square for these two, and capital A Z or V vertical for U 
over h squared. Okay? So, and in this case, this value is much smaller than that value. So the value over the constant value of the uh, AD viscosity, because this is AD viscosity, okay? So it's a constant which actually take in account the turbulent effect over the over the flow. So the horizontal AD viscosity is much larger than the vertical uh, AD viscosity, so that these two terms are retained, both of them. But this is not important from us. I mean, it's just important for you, you have you, you remember it if, if of course in the in the book it is written, but for us we can uh, safely consider this, uh, this, uh, uh, this approximation. Okay, the second um, equation is pretty similar. The V, the T, then we have the V here, we have just one. So we can do exactly the same thing because of course V scales like U and both scales are capital U, okay? So we may, um, uh, we may, we may uh, focus on the <coughs> On the third, so on the vertical one. So let me cancel here. So we can do the same exercise. So dW the T plus U the W the X plus. V the W the Y plus W the W the Z minus F star U equal to minus one over two zero the P the Z plus U. Y <coughs> Okay, so again, first How much you? W over T. This. Second derivative. Then the F over the X, the F over the X, which is the the X, the F over the X. So if this F is W, the final is W over X L H whatever square. So, 
Let's try to consider first their left hand side. So omega u is much smaller, much larger than omega w. But if we look here, from this, we can say that omega is larger than 1 over t. So this means that this is omega u, the Coriolis term, is much larger than the local variation of vertical velocity. Let's look at this one. So u w l. So u over l is smaller than omega. So this is smaller than omega w. But omega w is much smaller than omega u. So my line. W square h. So this is equal to w multiplied by w over h, which is w. And w over h whoop, is, I can write, w over h is u over l. But w u over l is, again, much smaller the So on the left hand side, I just remain with the Coriolis term. <coughs> if I take a ratio between the Coriolis term and the most important term in the vertical momentum is the buoyancy term, okay? because it's the one which actually gives the, the real decoupling between the horizontal motion and the vertical motion. So if I do numerically, and I consider those numbers, I will see that this is much smaller than 1. You can do it. So the uh, Coriolis term always is smaller than the buoyancy term. So among these two, I can neglect this one. <coughs> now. With the same uh, argument that we had before, among these two, with respect to this one, still, I can neglect this one. OK? So what I obtain is 1, 2, and 3. So now we can consider, since it is extremely important when we consider the vertical motion, the presence or not of boundary layer, OK? We said before. So boundary layers are actually discontinuity surfaces which create some, uh, some change, of course, in the motion. We, what many of you maybe knew of the, the word shear. OK? Shear is when, if you have any kind of um, um, solid boundary, and if you have a certain velocity u at some distance, if you have this shear, it means that for some reason here, you can have the no slip condition. Okay, so it means that if this is z, u z is equal to zero. Okay, so we we say that if we have wind, of course, and we measure the wind very close to the to the to the bottom to the land, it will be very close to zero. Okay, we have the roughness, whatever. But in any case. We can say that the profile, the vertical profile of the velocity will try to decrease. So velocity will be um, delayed because of the frictional effect of the of the of the bottom. So <coughs> if we come, if we are far from boundary layer. This effect here is expressed by this term here. And in particular, by the term that we said before. So not the one related to w, 
but the one related to u. So <coughs> we can say that far from BL, this is true because w always is much smaller than u. But moreover, this is smaller than the um, the uh, rotational the Coriolis term. And you can do it as well by taking values of ni, of u, of h, and of omega. Okay? And this will give rise to a number which is called the Ekman number that we will see in a few minutes, which actually tells you the ratio between uh, the frictional effect due to a surface and the rotational effect. Okay? So, considering this, uh, this hypothesis, this term is much smaller than this one, which is much smaller than which one, this, which is much smaller than which, this one. So we can neglect also this term. So, this, smaller than this, smaller than this, that is smaller than this, and so, what do you obtain? And just two terms. So if I rewrite my equation, what do you see? The only two terms which remain are the vertical variation of pressure and the buoyancy term, which actually is nothing more than an so even if we are considering the Boussinex approximation and we are still considering all the possible hypotheses of our GFD, still the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the vertical equation still keep the hydrostatic uh, characteristic, which is extremely important. So <coughs> even in, in, in presence of substantial motion, large scale phenomena, because these are what we are looking, large scale phenomena, still remain uh, fully hydrostatic. So if we keep also the last uh, equation, which was the one I wrote here, so the density equation, which was simply put it here. Okay? So this term here will be delta rho L square K, and then I will have K delta rho H square. Okay? So again, this term, provided that we are considering the same value of K, but this term here, again, will, uh, will disappear with respect to this one. So uh, the vertical diffusion <coughs> always dominate over the, uh, the horizontal one. So what we obtain at the, at the end is what we call the primitive equation of GFT, where in this particular uh, form, we just maintained a, a dependency on the vertical of the eddy diffusi viscosity and the eddy diffusivity. Okay? So, slightly different from what we said, but just for, uh, for uh, let's say, easiness of, uh, of explanation, we kept inside the, the, the first derivative the, the, the function because uh, eddy diffusivity and eddy viscosities are function. So eddy diffusivity and eddy viscosity are properties of the flow, while molecular diffusivity and molecular viscosity or thermal conductivity are property of the fluid. Okay? So this is extremely important. Yeah. What you have from the eddy, so eddy diffusivity and eddy viscosities are prob property of the flow, because it's how the flow dynamically evolves so which is the, the level of turbulence? If the flow is laminar or not, how turbulent is it? How is the turbulent regime of the, fluid, of the flow? So these are functions. And you will have different value of this, okay? 
Well, if you consider the molecular ones, the first from that we considered, the molecular ones, of course, are property of the fluid. So air, water, mercury, water, water vapor, whatever. <coughs> OK, so x, y, and z momentum, where we have seen the z momentum hydrostatic, the continuity, and the energy, which, are, which only retain here, here, and here, the vertical diffusion. So we were very lucky because from the seven equations that we had before, now we have five equations for five variables with f and rho zero and g con. Well, f is not a constant. It depends on the latitude. Rho zero and g are constant. And these are two, um, two functions of, uh, of the vertical. Of course, you can consider this simply as constant. I mean, this is a model, OK? So you need the mathematical model to represent the effect of the smaller scales over the larger scales, if you want to describe your, uh, your flow. <coughs> uh, I didn't lose the ADV because I didn't Exactly. ADV viscosity, ADV diffusivity. Oh. ADV viscosity is uh, within the momentum. ADV diffusivity is within the energy. OK, so if now we take the new momentum, x momentum equation, so we have u over t. Then we have u squared over l, u squared over l, w u over h omega u and then we have p rho zero l and then we have let's say ni u u over h squared h squared thank you okay so in the horizontal as we said the rotation is the most important it plays the most important in the vertical is the, uh, the, the buoyancy term, which has this important role. So we can do something very interesting. So we can say, what is the, um, how each term compare with the, with the Coriolis term? So we just divide all these um, equations, I mean, like in a <laughs> scale analysis, by this term. So this will be, if I say u over t divided by omega u, so I will have 1 over omega t. If I do the same, I will have u over This is the same. This is w u h. Let me keep it like this. This is 1. This is p over rho 0 L omega u. This is OK? So do you recognize this term here? It's familiar. It's familiar. <laughs> These two, we already saw them at the beginning. This was what we call it omega, and this what what we call it epsilon. So now we can probably give their name. And this is the Rossby temporal number, and this is the Rossby number. So these are um, two adimensional terms. And in GFD, actually, we use uh, the names, the surnames of uh, very important scientists who gave a lot of contribution to GFD and use their capital letter. So in this case, we his main was Rosby. So he was a Swedish uh, meteorologist. And we use the, cap the, the first letter, capital R, and then the second one, smaller, OK? R-O. Then we put a T, because this is the temporal. Why the temporal? Because here, we are making the ratio between the local variation of velocity with the Coriolis. And what we said at the beginning is that we want to consider omega much smaller than 1. 
or more, smaller or order than one. So the Rossby number will be much smaller than one when we will have very rotating fluid. So if it is much smaller than one, it, it means that the variation, the local variation of velocity is much smaller than the Coriolis acceleration. So Coriolis acceleration is so important, it's so strong, that I don't care about how locally the velocity change. Rosby, again, now I'm making the, the ratio between the advection, the horizontal advection, and the, uh, the Coriolis. And I'm saying, again, that this is much smaller or smaller or order than one. So again, I'm saying that the advection can be neglected with respect to the uh, rotation. And this, yes? And this, you, it has squared before, it doesn't have squared before. Because I have divided by omega u. OK, divided by omega u. <coughs> so this actually gives me a scale for the dynamic pressure. So I've never had any scale for the dynamic pressure before. You remember that at the uh, last time we had to, when we use the, when we considered the boosting X approximation, we also split we split the term, the pressure term into the hydrostatic term plus the dynamic pressure. Okay? Then we have all we always had this P prime, but actually we said okay, we can neglect prime, but we have to remember <laughs> this is P prime, this is the dynamic pressure. And even, even for the dynamic pressure, the dynamic pressure has an hydrostatic uh, um, uh, dependency. So this is a scale for the dynamic pressure. While the scale for the hydrostatic pressure is rho zero g h, okay, because it's the is the value of, of this. This number here we, we anticipated before. So this is called Ekman. The Ekman number. Ekman was, we will see, I think next week, for sure next week. <coughs> Ekman number also is much smaller than one when we are far from the boundary, is order of one when we are close to the boundary. So when, if we are close to the boundary, it means that the flow starts to feel the boundary. So the effect of the vertical friction, or well, we say that the vertical diffusion, so how the shear start to be, uh, start to be switched on by the, the, the presence of the, uh, of the bottom is becoming important. So it's becoming more and more important and becoming of the same um, quantity of the, um, of the uh, diffusion. So diffusion and Coriolis are going to, to be compatible. So if we consider the last term and we multiply and divide by L, we can take, so U omega L, and what we obtain is W over H U L by Rossby. Okay? So I just multiply by L and divided by L. I extract the, ter the term of Rossby, U o divided by omega and L, and I obtain W H U and L. We can also write it W over H over U over L multiplied by rho. So this term, if rho is much smaller than 1, this term will be also much smaller than 1 because it is here. So in general, w over h, how we say it here, w over h is smaller or order of, of u over l. Okay? So it means that here, I am describing how the vertical divergence or convergence is um, comparable or not with the horizontal convergence or divergence. So if 
the horizontal convergence will be much larger than the uh, vertical one, so it means that my flow will be mostly two-dimensional. Sorry? This one? Yes. Okay. So up to now, are you okay? Okay. So we have the ratio between W over H and U over L, which is exactly this one. Because we, we found it from the uh, continuity uh, equation. And uh, W over H was came from the ZW, and this came from the XU plus the YV. Okay? So from here, we said that the vertical divergence or convergence, or the vertical motion, if they diverge or if they converge, they must be always in presence of solid boundary as we are, as we have in, in our planet, smaller or at least same order of the horizontal divergence or convergence. Okay, so I can be, I can have much more convergence on the horizontal plane than what I have on the vertical one. And here is what I, I, uh, I have. So if this, since this term is much smaller than 1, or smaller or the order 1, in any case, Rosby is always much smaller than 1. So this term here always can be much smaller than 1, or let's say at maximum 1, never larger than 1. Which is important because this term here, in some sense, couple the horizontal velocity with the vertical velocity because this is w dz u so it's the advection of u along the vertical so is the actually is the real shear term because here we are having the variation of u over z okay so i'm transporting the variation of u in the vertical, in the vertical. Okay, so it's like sort of a, let's say transport, transport of a horizontal momentum in the vertical, while these two are transport of horizontal momentum in the horizontal. Okay, so transporting something in this uh, uh, plane or transporting something in this. Of course, if this term is very strong, it means that I can have very much variation in the vertical. So always try to uh, put in your mind how, the, the, how a parcel is uh, moved in the vertical and the horizontal and how it is transported thanks to these terms. Because these terms here are very important, are non-linear terms, okay? <coughs> they are second order. Sir, I'm not clear with the difference between the two numbers, please. These two? No, this one and this one. This one. Rosby and Hickman. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So Rosby is when I compare local variation of time, local time variation with respect to the Coriolis, and I obtain the temporal Rosby number. Mm -hmm. Here I am comparing the advection term, the horizontal advection, with Coriolis, and I obtain Rosby. Mm -hmm. Here I am considering something completely different, is the friction. So it's the vertical friction compared with the, uh, the Coriolis again, okay? So these two create only, let's say, I'm uh, considering only the horizontal plane. This is something that is considering also the vertical plane because this is important when uh, it becomes important when we are close to a boundary. When we are close to the boundary, this term will start to be of the same order of omega u. Because don't remember, don't forget that we are just comparing everything to this one. So if we say that this is much smaller than one, 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 what we have remain are just these two. Sorry. We don't have any anything to, to, to say about that. We just have a scale for the dynamic pressure. So if all these terms here are much smaller than one, so I'm having, uh, I'm far from the boundary, I'm having a very fast motion 
let's say, uh, sorry, not very fast motion, very slow motion or very fast rotating rate, it depends, okay? Because if I have this, it's very important, eh? so, so if 1 over omega t is much smaller than 1, it means that So the time variation, so it means u over t much smaller than omega. So, and if I want, you can play as much as you like. So the velocity will be, the scale for the velocity, uh, wait, u, u. <coughs> well, yes, it's the same. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it means that the local variation of the velocity is much smaller than the Coriolis. Okay. So my uh, the, the 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 fact that we are having the fact that we are in a rotating framework is much more important than how my velocity is changing in that point. Okay. The other term u over L much smaller than omega, it means that the rotation rate is much larger than the rate of change of the velocity with respect to the length. Okay? So or I have u much smaller than L omega, or I have L much smaller than u over omega. So or I have slow motion, velocity much smaller than this, or large length, much smaller, much larger than u over omega. Okay? So this one here says how uh, the motion is changing in the, in, the ver in the horizontal, while this is saying which is the, um, the effect of the solid boundary over the motion. Just to be clear, so um, the close to the boundary, the Rossby temporal and Rossby numbers are way less than one. Close to the boundary, there is no problem with the Rossby. It's Ekman. Yes. Okay. Ekman close to the boundary will be order than one. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So it means order of one. Order of one. Far from the boundary. Is less than one. Okay. Far from the boundary is less than one, because close to the boundary, this term is important because it's starting to be important to, to reduce, to create the shear, to reduce the velocity up to zero. So what, In, what conditions do we have this less than one or the other? This one. Yes. So this is when we consider the GFD phenomenon. Okay. When T is much larger than 24 hours. <coughs> okay, any of you knows about the Reynolds number? Reynolds number? Yeah. OK, so the Reynolds number is the number which is another number named after a very important uh, scientist, Osborne Le Reynolds. And uh, it's practically considered not just Exactly. We will see. Exactly. Of course. <coughs> so the Reynolds number is <coughs> the ratio between inertial and friction or advection and friction. So since we before consider inertial or advection and Coriolis and friction over Coriolis. So inertial over Coriolis is Rossby and this is Ekman. The only difference if we take is the aspect ratio 
because Ekman depends on H on, and Rosby depends on A. So if we consider um, the Reynolds number, it scales like Rosby over Ekman multiplied by this factor. But L is much smaller, much larger than H. So this is usually because these two can be of the same order, smaller, or order than one. So these two can be, let's say, uh, same order. What is important is this one. So Ekman scales like the aspect ratio, so the, the ratio between uh, the horizontal scale and the vertical scale, which is much more than one, much larger than one. So it means that GFD flows are turbulent, okay? Because the Reynolds number says that how larger is the inertia with respect to the friction, the larger the inertial term or the advection term or the nonlinear term, whatever you want to, to call them, the more easy is the evolution of the, uh, of the, trans of the turbulent uh, motions, okay? <coughs> so now we are quite safe to start and analyze this uh, primitive equation because we have really try to, to simplify as much as possible. And so we will start by considering the case that I mentioned before. So the, the case where all the numbers are very small. So we take Rosby temporal much smaller than one. Rosby much smaller than one. Ekman much smaller than one, rho equal to zero. So this means that we are considering large scale flow, very slow, or fast rotating rate, but we cannot change rate, rotating rate in our, in our planet because uh, it is fixed. So large scale and slow, large scale and slow flows, far from the boundary layer, and homogeneous, okay? So rho, which is uh, the variation of, uh, of density, you remember, rho equal rho zero plus rho prime, then we neglect all the prime. So this rho is exactly the variation of density that we have here in the, in the equation, the third equation. So with this assumption, we are going to simplify very, very much our equations because as you have seen before, if the temporal Rosby is much smaller than one, this term and this term can be neglected with respect to this one. If the Rosby is much smaller than one, it means that all the advection can be neglected res with respect to, uh, to this one. If uh, Ekman is much smaller than one, it means that these two terms and these two terms, again, can be neglected with respect to Coriolis. So the x momentum simply becomes a balance between the Coriolis and the gradient of pressure. Same thing in the y, while the z momentum, it's even easier because we have 0 equal to minus 1 over rho 0, the z p, because rho is equal to 0. And then we have the continued equation, which remains. So this, uh, this system of equation has been strongly simplified, strongly, strongly, strong. So we can actually, we have lost the second term derivative because the second derivative 
sorry, the second derivative term. The second derivative term were here, and if we neglect here this term because of the Ekman number much more than one, be because we are far from the from the uh, from the boundary, so we lose uh, one boundary condition because you know that if you have a, a partial differential equation, the uh, the order of the, the of the equation is the same as the number of boundary equation of boundary condition. What is the indication that we are far from the boundary? Because Ekman is much smaller than one. Okay. So with Ekman much smaller than one, mm -hmm. we have the defriction. This term here is much smaller than Coriolis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we can try to make some consideration. So if we consider the two horizontal equations and we calculate the vertical the variation in the vertical so how they vary they vary in the vertical so this is the z minus f v equal to minus one over root zero the z the x p then the z f u equal to minus one over root zero the z the y p. Okay, f is constant, it doesn't change in z, so I can uh, put sorry, it. Sorry, you said we have the vertical variation. Sorry? What are we doing? I'm, I want to, my idea, my question is how this, so this uh, flow mm -hmm. is described by these two equations in the horizontal and this term in That's the vertical. vertical. So my, my question is, is there a shear? So what is the variation of the velocity component in the vertical. Okay. So I just calculate and make the derivative. So this will become f minus the z v. Look at here. So we can invert the order of uh, derivation. And if we invert the order of derivation here and here, we apply the z derivation to p. But p doesn't change in the vertical. So p is constant at every vertical level, every depth in the ocean, p is the same. So this is 0. And also this is 0. So we have that there is no shear. So for these specific flows, which are called geostrophic, which comes from the Greek. Geo means earth, and strophic means turning. Geostrophic. The geostrophic flows for all this, or? So this is the, these are the equations of the geostrophic flow which respond to this hypothesis. So I, never, I just uh, take, started from the primitive equation, I applied this hypothesis, and this hypothesis tell me that the only balance in the vertical is between the Coriolis and the gradient of pressure. So I'm just doing that. So. Is the geostrophic flow the same as geostrophic balance? Exactly. Well, this is the geostrophic balance, and the flow, now we are going to, to solve it, because flow means velocity, OK? So this is the, the equation for the geostrophic flow, which is based on geostrophic balance, which is the balance between the Coriolis and the horizontal pressure, the horizontal gradient of pressure. <coughs> the first thing that we have obtained is that geostrophic flow do, doesn't have shear, no shear. And this is also known as the Taylor Goodman theorem. So what does it mean that there is no, no shear? So it means that we cannot have something 
like we had before, OK? So this is shear. Shear is when you are close to a boundary. Now we are far from a boundary, so we are not considering this. Okay, this is not our business now. So we are here. So it means that from a level to the top, we have the same value of velocity u and v at each uh, uh, vertical level. Okay, so in vertical, we do not have any kind of a change in the horizontal velocity. So horizontal velocity, uh, my flow, are like, let's say, tubes, like cylinders. So I'm having the same flow, the same velocity, at all the levels, all the vertical levels. No shear. So u and v are just function are just u x y t and v x y t because the variation in, in the horizontal is the one given by the uh, horizontal uh, pressure gradient. Okay, so now let's try to solve this flow, which is quite easy. So from the equations of the geostrophy, so I can solve u from here. u is equal to minus 1 rho 0 f dyp, and v is equal to 1 over rho 0 f dxp. Finish. This is the geostrophic flow. I can also write it like using the, the, um, the vector and putting an h, which is u and v. Okay, so I just consider the horizontal. There is no vertical. Of course, there can't be any vertical um, velocity. There isn't, simply. <laughs> so this is 1 over rho 0 f, which is a, a constant. <clears throat> and then we have k multiplied by the gradient of uh, p. So this is a vector product between the, uh, or the vertical versor and the horizontal gradient. Okay? So if, we, if you calculate this, again, e, j, k, 0, 0, 1, the xp, the yp, 0. OK? So the first is 0 minus the y, the p. The second is plus the x, the p. And the third is 0. OK? So. This thing, even if it is so simple, still says us something more. <clears throat> so, another very important property. If I do the uh, scalar product of the horizontal velocity and the vertical gradient and the horizontal gradient of pressure, it is actually zero. Okay? So I, I must have, I must do this multiplied by uh, the x the p and this multiplied by the y the p. Okay? Because this is u v the x p the y t. So u the x the p plus v the y the p. But u depends on the y the p with the minus and v depends on the x the p. So this is u. So it means that 
the horizontal velocity is always perpendicular to the uh, pressure gradient. Wow. This is a revolution. So if uh, I have a pressure field where I have higher pressure on the right and lower pressure on the left, I can have a gradient, horizontal gradient of pressure, which is in this direction, which is positive. OK? Mm -hmm. So I'm going towards higher pressure. So if uh, there is no, in this uh, particular case, I don't have u, because the y, the p is 0, so it's constant over the y. But I have v, which is positive as well. So if you think to bend, so it means that when I will arrive to this point, I will have this as gradient of pressure. So I will have two components. And so the other, in the, in the specific case, I will have a velocity which is perpendicular. Always must be perpendicular. So in the considering F positive, so I'm in the northern hemisphere, please forgive me, <laughs> but it's easier. <laughs> what we have is that the flow will be always flowing with the um, high pressure on its right and with low pressure on its left. So it will go in this direction and in this direction. Which? Sir, you are a fluid and you are moving from low to high. From low like to high, yes. Because the gradient is at the high. Yes. So ordinarily you should move from the high to the low, not rather from low to high. The high. No, the gradient is always pointing toward the high value. So from high to low. From low to high. Gradient. Gradient. Um, uh, as we know, from high to low. From high to low. is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So if you if you are in a if you are in a uh, without rotation, so think about a YouTube. So I'm having pressure here and pressure here. No one is using this one. Okay. <coughs> so in this case, I will have that the velocity, the flow, is parallel to the gradient. In this case, is perpendicular. So. This helps us to describe what is happening in, <coughs> in our atmosphere, for example. So if we consider a uh, closed uh, isobars around a high, higher pressure, where this pressure P2 is larger than P1, so I'm going towards the higher pressure. So I'm so not saying <laughs> is the Kushman who, who is saying. <laughs> so I I trust him usually, and you do would do the same. So gradient is going is pointing toward the higher value. So I have that the velocity is always perpendicular. So we'll go rotating clockwise in this direction. The law will be the opposite, and counterclockwise for F positive. Of course, in the southern hemisphere, it will be irreversible. Okay? So this is a picture taken from a low pressure system over Iceland. So we have counterclockwise rotation. Okay? So geostrophic flow, actually, even it's very, very simple, because we just start from this. 
So we just start considering these four hypotheses, but actually it's very useful to explain the um, high level circulation in the atmosphere or the large gyre current in the ocean. So when we have these hypotheses which are satisfied, so we are far from the boundary, we have very large scale and slow motion, <coughs> and we are, let's say, homogeneous flow, of course, this is ideal, no? So uh, otherwise, it would be very, <laughs> very easy to, to describe uh, uh, our, our flows in the uh, atmosphere and the ocean. So we can actually represent things like this. So this is the, the, the jet stream over North America. So we have a higher pressure center here with the uh, um, wind blowing in this direction, and here we have a low pressure. Of course, this is not at the surface, okay? So we are saying the solid line are actually high contour of given pressure, 500 millibars, okay? So we are about 5,000 meters from the top. This is the usual geopotential surface that meteorology use for um, for the weather forecast, well, okay. <coughs> so, however, it says because atmospheric pressure variation are large in the vertical and weak in the horizontal, the two sets of contours are nearly identical by virtue of the hydrostatic balance. According to meteorology convention, wind vector blah blah blah. Okay. So we have the wind here, which is going following the isobars. Okay. So we can say that geostrophic flows are isobaric. <clears throat> OK, so we can do one more thing to our geostrophic flow model, because it's a model. So I mean, it's a idealized uh, description of the nature. It's a very simple model, but. It works. You say, of course, we can, this would be the, the first approximation. Of course, we can consider, in the most general of case, we will have uh, other terms, ag, agiostrophic. So everything which is, which is not geostrophic can be put here. OK? So in the most general of case, we can describe our flow as a geostrophic flow because first and foremost our planet is rotating and we have um, fluids so the first balance is between the effect of rotation which is the calorie term and the uh, variation of pressure which is done which is given by the by the sun at the end because sun is going to heat differentially poles with respect to, to equator. So without any other consideration, this is the base for the, the description. All the other things, uh, heat fluxes, humidity, thermal line uh, flows uh, in the ocean, are described by the non-geostrophic or agiostrophic OK, so if, uh, so we know that F, is actually a, a function of latitude. And uh, this means that it's not constant. So in first approximation, if we are considering a fixed latitude, and we are considering uh, like a sort of plane around this latitude, so we can say that the variation in y of f is equal to 0. So you remember that we take z, y, and x. Okay. So I say that this is an approximation, and it's called f-plane. So what happened in the f-plane? If I calculate the x u and the y v, which is nothing more than the horizontal divergence of convergence. So the x u plus the y v. So the x u, if f is constant, is nothing more than 
minus 1 root 0 f dx y p and dy dv is plus 1 over root 0 f again dx y p so it's 0 so this is the fourth so we had the fact that the velocity is obaric the fact that there is no shear the fact that the velocity is well, it's obaric or perpendicular to the um, to the um, pressure value uh, it doesn't make work also there is no work made because uh, you know that you can do work when you multiply velocity by pressure value there is no work so geotrophic flow can go forever without any kind of stop and this is actually doing this on Jupiter so Jupiter you are saying the different bands because the um, uh, there is a, a very strong uh, uh, let's say it is like a very nice approximation of the geotrophic flow okay and it's going forever so the, the grid rod spot is there for I don't know thousands of years but let's come back here so in the F plane this is the, the last uh, uh, properties that we have in F plane we have zero divergence so in F plane <clears throat> okay so The Coriolis term is, has this uh, expression. So this expression means that we have a variation of the Coriolis with respect to the latitude. So it will be 0 at the equator and 2 omega at the poles. Okay? Because it goes like sin of the latitude. Now, but latitude change as y. So if I'm here or here, I have that latitude, of course, is function of the of the y direction. So let's suppose that we are considering a plane, which we call f plane. So we approximate a fixed value of y, which is the value of latitude. Okay. So if the variation of f with respect to y is zero, so it's is constant. So it's like I'm considering like a band, a zonal band. Okay, so no big variation of f in the in the vertical. I'm considering f plane, which is nothing more than considering, let's say, a band here. So look at here, this part where the, the flow is very stretched. This is a band where the, the, the value of f change not so much. And if it is like this, I can make the, the, the calculate the divergence of the, of the velocity of the geostrophic flow. And I can neglect the fact that since I have to do the x of this and the y of this, at the moment I consider, so I should go to make the, I should take the y derivative of f in principle. But since I'm saying that this is zero, I then do not consider this. So the only thing that I can do is just apply the x derivative over this and the y derivative over this. And since there is a minus, I obtain zero. So on the f plane, the other important properties, geostrophic flows are non-divergent. Okay? So it means that on the f plane, like that, there is no m possibility to have vertical flows because if if vertical flows are divergent dxu plus dyv is equal to zero it means that the vertical divergence or convergence is zero as well so 
it means that the velocity is constant. But we know that there is a solid boundary somewhere, and we have to consider to keep the mass conservance, the, the conservation of mass. So we must say that w is 0 at z equal to 0. So somewhere in the planet, over the atmosphere or over the ocean, vertical velocity must be 0. So if vertical velocity must be 0 and the, there is no variation of vertical velocity, I must have that vertical velocity must be 0 everywhere. So it means that on the F plane, don't forget this, on the F plane, so only in the F plane, I can have vertical velocity equal to 0. And so, sorry? For every Z. For every Z, exactly. So there is no movement in the vertical, OK? Which actually is something that it comes from the fact that we started from considering no shear flow. So no shear flow, I have flows that have this sort of vertical rigidity. So in the vertical plane, I do not have any kind of uh, variation in the flow. OK? So no shear, and moreover, on the F plane, no vertical velocity. OK? Which is basically, um, say, uh, quite clear, because how can I have, I mean, if I have something here, I, I do have some reduction of the flow here in order to conserve the mass. So this is not possible. <clears throat> OK, so this means that geotrophic flows are isobaric. And on a plane, we say naturally non divergent. Is it here? I mean, when you say is a bike, it's a. Uh, it's included because you don't have any kind of, uh, of change in the vertical. <coughs> so, Cosi? No? Naturally. Naturally, because it's a, a sort of a natural consequence of the equations. So, I just, I don't have any kind of more hypothesis. I mean, my hypothesis are this one. The only hypothesis that I did, I do before, is this one. Okay. Is the plus hypothesis that I added to this one. So, <coughs> there is no other, let's say, it's not forced the non-divergence. So it's, uh, it's natural. That's why I put some. <coughs> and, uh, and yes, what we can also consider is that if, and only if we would be so if we are close to the boundary so the equation of geotrophic flows as you remember have lost the second derivative term in the z okay so mathematically speaking, it means that uh, we have lost one boundary condition. So one of the boundary conditions that we, we use to, uh, to consider is the no-slip condition. Okay? So if you consider, which is exactly what? Exactly. But since we have no shear, mm -hmm. even if, okay, so take this like sort of a of, uh, general consideration. So. In geostrophy, we, we have this one, okay? 
So we are far from the boundary. But in any case, if we would like to consider how is the flow at the boundary, it is this one. So this fact here, it means that there is no boundary layer. So there is no any kind of layer which creates which gives the opportunity to the flow to go to zero. OK? So we are far from the boundary. But the fact that we are far from the boundary means that there is no any kind of effect of the boundary over the flow. But the effect of the boundary over the flow is given by the second derivative term, which are zero, because it is our hypothesis. So I can consider the fact that the flow is having a sort of a relationship with the boundary. And this boundary, this relationship is the slip. So flows actually are slipping. If there are boundaries, they are slipping with the boundary. So there is no boundary layer which decouple the value of the geostrophic interior into the, uh, the, closer, uh, the, 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 the layer close to the boundary. Okay? And this is mathematically. Um, a consequence of the fact that we neglected the second derivative. Okay? Because when you keep this, you have to say that u0 a is equal to 0. Well, u at z equal to 0. Okay? So this will be quite useful for the uh, next lesson. And, uh, and yes.